Church family, it's good to see you all this evening. My name is Andy, and I get to help lead worship with this incredible team up here. And by worship, I mean we're going to sing songs that tell of the greatness of our God, that tell the story of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And also in worship, we're going to read Scripture out loud together. That's how we're going to start our service. So if you'll turn your attention to the screens up here, we're going to put up Psalm 147. And let's say this out loud. You ready? Praise the Lord. How good to sing praises to our God. How delightful and how fitting. The Lord is rebuilding Jerusalem and bringing the exiles back to Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. He counts the stars and calls them all by name. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. The Lord supports the humble but he brings the wicked down into the dust. This is the word of the Lord, and we say, thanks be to God. Come on, let's sing together. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop? the light from getting through and do you wish that you could see it all made new is all creation groaning is a new creation coming
Good evening, Church on the Move. So great to see all of you tonight. We're so glad that you're here, whether you're here in the room or watching online. We're so glad to see you. My name's Lee. If I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, and I am up here with a man that needs no introduction. Pastor Greg Scott is with me up here. Yeah, I knew that was going to happen. 
I knew that was going to happen. Pastor Greg oversees our 180 student ministry as well as our young adults, and both of those areas of our church are just thriving right now. We're going to talk a little bit about what's coming up this week, but before we jump into that, if you're brand new around here, we've got something for you. If you take your phone out right now, maybe it's your first time here, text us. Our number's 23101. It's here on the screen behind me. Send us the word new. We're going to send you back a little Chick-fil-A gift card. Go get a treat on us this week. It's just our way of saying thanks for being here, and we'd love to have you come back. And some of you took us up on that, and you've come back. You're saying, okay, how do I get connected? How do I get plugged in? Hey, we do something every month called The Next Move. It's a great next step for you. Find out a little bit about who we are and where we're going, and we like a chance to get to know you, what brought you to church on The Move. And so if you wanna join us, we're having a meal together. We do it on Sunday right after our 1030 service. Just text the word NEXT to 23101, and you can find out information and get signed up there. But last weekend, we had Love Day. That's a big uh, moment, a big weekend in the life of our church. Well, there's another one coming up this weekend. Our Uncommon Student Conference starts on Wednesday. It's a big deal around here. We had 980-some students last year, biggest one yet. We already, and we've still got registrations coming in, we've already got over 1,200 students, mostly from our three, yeah. 1,200 students, you guys. That's a powerful thing in the life of our student ministry. Yeah, one of the reasons that we do this is uh, kids are going back into school, and this we've strategically put it at the end of summer to get them ready spiritually to do it. They need an encounter with God. We have 10 churches coming to be a part of it, plus the three that we have here in, in the Tulsa area. It's a, it's a catalytic moment for our students. And you being a part of it, being a part of financially supporting this is a huge, huge deal for us. Because m- most of you know, these kids need God. They may not live in a home like some of you do where everything is at peace. It's not always that way. It's very complex for them. They live in an adult world, even though they're in a teen body and trying to think through things as a student. They don't, they have real adult issues that are going on and they need the power of God, the presence of God to actually help them catapult them carry them in many cases through uh, school. Yeah. So that's why we do it. Yeah, and I know from my two boys who are now graduated, Uncommon was like the absolute highlight spiritually for them of the year. This is an event that moves the needle for the next generation to connect with Jesus. The only way we're able to do things like Love Day and Uncommon is because of partnership as a church family. And so as we do in all of our services, we're going to remind you that one of the ways you partner with us is the way you give. So many of you give faithfully. We're going to do that right now. Like if, if you got your phone, if you haven't, don't already set this up automatically, it's easy to give around here. You just text the word give to 23101. You can give in that way sort of to our regular tithes. But we also have two other ways that we give. One is our compassion offering. That goes to meet immediate needs here in Tulsa and really around the world. You can text CO to give to that fund. And we're also in a season of expansion around here. We're, we're doing some things to our building, lobbies, kids areas, cafe, to better accommodate the needs of our church family. And so if you want to give to that, that's just EXP for expansion to that same number, 23101. But there's one other way that you can partner with us, special, this week. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Would you stand back to your feet? Would you look in the seat back in front of you and you're gonna see a card like this? I want you to grab one of those. Because of all the things we have planned for students this week, and we've got some amazing things planned, speakers and workshops and games, it's gonna be an amazing week for our church. But of all the things that we could do as a church, the most powerful thing is we could pray for these students by name. And the name on that card is the actual first name of a registered student that is coming to Uncommon. And so we're gonna invite you. And if you, if you didn't see a card in the seat back in front of you, maybe there wasn't one in your section or somebody else grabbed it, these cards will be on the, uh, on, at the exits on the way out as well. Grab one, grab two if you feel like it. Would you commit to pray for this student? I have Jack right here. I'm gonna take this card with me. I'm gonna pray for Jack this week because... We believe that God wants to meet in a powerful way with Jack and whatever name is on your card. Pastor Greg, what can we pray, be praying for specifically for these young people? Yeah, one of the things I think you have to understand is these kids have serious uh, spiritual opposition. Even for them to get here, some of them, the enemy will try anything he can, even in their parents or grandparents or something happening in their home to keep them away from here. We need to take authority over the enemy. I'm just telling you. It's a serious thing for these kids. They need to get here, number one. We need to pray. When they get here, we need to, we need to make sure that their hearts are open to experience God in a, in a fresh new way. They will. We, our team's ready for this. We are totally ready. We just need prayer. And then 
for safety and overseeing 1,200 kids, we actually had to move the conference from 180 into this auditorium because yeah. we couldn't keep them. We can't house, house them all. Yeah. And God help, I need prayer. <laughs> Our team needs prayer. Listen, yeah. God's got this. We're just riding a wave that he created. I mean, I, I can't create this. Yeah. We're just going to ride and learn how to ride a wave that he created. And so that's the type of we need to pray against the spiritual opposition, yeah. that their hearts are open, and pray for our staff and our teams. That's, that's right. That's what we need. And a lot of you are volunteering to help with the conference, but, oh, yeah. but all of us can partner in prayer. So take that name. Care about the, what, what would it do to our city, to a generation of 1,200 students drew nearer to Jesus this week? What kind of impact would that have? It's more than we can ask or imagine. And so let us ask and let us begin to imagine. Partner with us in this way. Pastor Greg, before we move on with our time of worship, I would just ask you, kind of start this process for us this week. Would you pray for Uncommon as well as what we're doing here tonight? Absolutely. Let's pray. Father, we lift all these cards up to you. I have Reese and Phoenix. I call their name out before you tonight. Lord, we take authority over all the spiritual opposition that they would face, Lord. We take authority over the enemy trying to steal, kill, and destroy anything, them getting here any way. Lord, I'm asking that your angels be sent forth to prepare the way for them to be here. Intervene, Lord, in a mighty way. Lord, when they get here, I ask you that their hearts, their hearts would be open, that your eyes would see. They would clearly hear your voice. Lord, I pray for our staff and our team. Lord, refresh us. Keep us fresh. Keep us alert. Keep us, keep us active, looking seeking ways to help minister to kids, Lord. Everything we do for a teenager, the answer is yes. We ask you to move. Father, we thank you for the rest of the, this service tonight. We thank you for your anointing being upon it. Help us enter in. Bless the people that are giving gifts tonight. We honor you tonight, sir. Thank you for everything you're going to do this week. We praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing this chorus together. Christ alone. Christ alone.
come before your throne and worship. We love you. We give you our praise in Jesus' name. Everyone said, come on, make some noise for your God. Make a joyful noise. Come on. Amen. Man, it's so good to worship with our church family tonight. Why don't you turn around, shake someone's hand, give them a fist bump. Let them know you're glad to be here tonight. You can be seated. Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see you guys tonight. Welcome to Church on the Move. If you're new here, my name is Whit. Glad to have you here this weekend. We got a lot to cover. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to grab it and try to find the book of Haggai. Uh, it's right near the end of the Old Testament. I'm giving you a few minutes. I'm going to be giving you a few announcements here, so you might need a minute because it's, it's very short. It might only be a couple of pages in your Bible right near the end of the Old Testament while you're turning there. I um, want to let you know about a couple of things that are really important kind of happening over the next couple of weeks. One, we're changing our service times. Now, for you Saturday night folks, this isn't going to affect you at all, but if you do come on Sunday morning, we're making room for growth. Church on the Move continues to grow. We've continued over the last four years to just see consistent, steady growth. And what we're doing is we're actually moving our 1130 service that was or has been up at our 180 building, we're moving it here. So that makes us adjust kind of our Sunday schedule just a little bit. We're moving our 9 a.m. service to 8.30, our 10.30 service to 10, and then the 11.30 service that's been up there uh, at 180 will be here. And we feel like that service can grow here and in this room a little bit more, and so we're excited about that. But even better, it gives people who serve, if you serve on a Sunday, gives you an easier opportunity to serve and attend a single service. Also, just doing it all in this room, for you can imagine, it's just far more efficient to be able to do it that way. So um, this begins August 18th, but we're just letting you know, like I said, if you're a Saturday nighter, it doesn't affect you a bit, but if you come on Sunday, our schedule will change on August 18th. And we're expecting some growth because uh, I am going to be starting a new series I don't even know when, put it up there, Let me, I'll tell you, same weekend, okay, cool, uh, called How to Be Married. And um, one, I, I think this will be really helpful, but two, I think we really need this right now. Uh, just kind of pastorally, uh, what we're experiencing, we're, we're in the middle of what I might just call a marriage crisis right now with a lot of families here within this congregation. And this isn't meant to be aimed at anybody or try to fix people from the stage, but rather just realizing there's a need and our families are under attack and um, this is something that we need to talk about. So we're going to take some time. We had a different idea kind of where we were going to go this fall, but over the past few weeks just been sensing this, feeling like this is the direction that we want to go. Don't know how long this series will be. Got a couple of different ideas about that, but we're going to spend some time on this because I think it's really needed. And this is more than just tips and tricks. This is reframing our mindset about what it means to be married, what God thinks about marriage, and letting that reshape kind of our approach. I'm telling you, the problem with so many of our marriages is the approach. We've been shaped more by culture and movies than we have been by scripture. And so as we dig into this, I think it's going to be really illuminating and helpful. So uh, excited, really excited to jump into that in just a couple of weeks. And then uh, next weekend, last announcement, then we'll jump into Haggai. Next weekend, I, I want to give you an update as to where we stand with our expansion campaign. Many of you have been faithfully giving toward that. I've got a huge kind of uh, just an update for you next weekend. want to show you some new images of kind of the, the front that we've been working on. We've not been idle behind the scenes. I promise you there's a lot been going on, and I want to show it to you next week. So I'll have slides, pictures, all the things, and uh, we'll have a good time sharing that with you next weekend. So if you're interested in that, don't miss next weekend's service. All right, Haggai. Um, so yeah, we've been covering the minor prophets. Uh, they're not minor because they're not important. They're minor because their books are short, and Haggai uh, is no exception. It might be the shortest of all the minor prophets, uh, only just a couple of chapters, uh, but has a really important message, really impactful message for us. I want to help us kind of understand sort of where this sits in the context of Israel's story, Haggai comes after the exile. Now, I get it. For many of you, exile doesn't mean anything to you. This is not American history. It's not something we were taught in school, so we don't really have a framework for how the kind of timeline of what happens in the Scripture goes, and so I want to help you kind of understand a little bit of that tonight. I'm not going to spend long on this, but give you a little bit of context. So the exile 
is when the, well, two different exiles happened actually, but we're just talking about the southern exile. The kingdom, if you remember, last weekend had split. There was a civil war. After Solomon was king, the kingdom divided. Israel divided into the northern and the southern kingdom. And the northern kingdom went into exile from the Assyrian army uh, in 722, I think, B.C., and then uh, 586, Babylon comes through and wipes out Jerusalem, destroys the temple. We talked about this last week. If you were here and we talked about Habakkuk, Habakkuk lived on this side of the, of the Babylonian uh, uh, exile, right? And so in 586, Babylon ultimately comes. God had foretold through Habakkuk that they were going to come. They finally do come in 586, and they destroy Jerusalem and destroy the temple. So when that happens, obviously a lot of people die, but then many people, Daniel being one of those, if you remember the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fiery furnace, they're carried off. This is what would happen. People would come through, uh, a king would come through, they would destroy the city, and then they would take the best of the people, and they would take them back to wherever they were from as slaves. They were sort of bringing them, assimilating them into their culture. Rather miraculous that no matter how many times the Jews, the Jewish people were conquered, they, they never lost their national identity. That's really something quite miraculous. 586 is when this happens, 586 years before Christ. So around 50 years later, Babylon, though, is conquered by Persia. King Cyrus captures Babylon. And so now all of those Jews who had been under the control of the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar are now under the king, uh, the Persian king Cyrus. And then in 538, Cyrus decrees, big deal here, that the Jews can return to their homeland and rebuild their temple. Of course, you can read something about this in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. You get something of that story detailed there. And then the book of Haggai takes place in 520 B.C. Now, just to kind of give you a little bit of further detail, somewhere sort of right in here is when they began rebuilding the temple. This would have been in 536 B.C. So they come back, about 50,000 Jews come back to their homeland, and they begin the work of rebuilding the temple, only they don't get very far. This is not just a history lesson. This is important context for what we're going to be studying as we dive into Haggai tonight. So they begin to lay the foundation of the temple, but they don't get very far, as we'll see. And then about 17 years pass, and then God comes to speak through the prophet Haggai to the people. So most of the prophets, of every single one of the prophets that we've read so far, have been on the front end of the exile, meaning it had not happened yet. Now we're dealing with prophets that are speaking after the exile. That's where uh, Haggai is. So all of these Jews have returned home. That's who he's speaking to. Now, we're going to dive in. So what I want to do tonight is look at three different words from the Lord. There are more than that in Haggai, but we're going to look at three that uh, I've divided up kind of in this way. We're going to look at a challenge, an encouragement, and a promise. That's kind of the outline that I've got for us, a challenge an encouragement and a promise. So if you have a Bible open, we're going to look first at the challenge beginning in Haggai 1.1. It says this, in the second year of King Darius, King Darius had replaced King Cyrus. So he's a Persian king. King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, he's speaking about kind of what the sort of sentiment is of the people. The time has not yet come, and this is really going to be the theme here of this first challenge that God is going to give his people. The time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Remember, they had laid the foundation, or at least begun to lay the foundation, but they'd stopped. They were no longer working on it. And so now he's saying, what, what, what you're saying to yourselves is, yeah, it's not time to finish it. You can imagine, economically, they weren't in a great place. Politically, they weren't in a great place. They didn't have much power. They didn't have much money. So they were deferring, building, rebuilding the temple where worship would take place. They were re deferring that till later. We'll do that at another time. Now is not the right time. 
God is confronting them about this. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai, and he says this, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses? Now that doesn't mean much to us, but the idea of a paneled house is a house that you're fixing up. You're you're, you're putting some real effort and energy. In other words, this is more than just getting a a roof over your head. You're you're making this thing nice. You're, You're living in a paneled house. He says, is it right or is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house, what is he talking about when he's referring to this house? The temple. While my house remains a ruin, you're working on your own agenda. Meanwhile, you're neglecting my honor, my temple, my house. Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says Give careful thought to your ways. If you read through Haggai, this is going to come up again and again and again. In fact, this is something of this first challenge here, to examine the priorities of your life. Give careful thought. Give consideration to your ways. You have planted much, God says, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. There's that phrase again. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored. God is confronting his people through the prophet Haggai here with an important challenge. If you wanted to kind of boil it down to a simple question, it could be something like this. Whose house are you building? In other words, what what is the passion, the focus, the energy of your life? To whom or to what is it directed? He's challenging our allegiances to really examine our lives. And if we were to do that this weekend, we might examine our lives across maybe, I don't know, three different strata. You could look at your time. Where does God show up in your time? Does he get your priority? Does he get your first, your best, your, your passion, your energy? There's a difference between your time and your energy. Often our time goes to what we're passionate about, but they are not the same thing. What is your focus? What is your passion? What is your energy? What do you give yourself to? First, I'm not saying, and the Lord isn't saying here that you can't have any hobbies. In fact, the theme of what we're talking about here, what the Lord is saying to his people through Haggai is very much akin to what Jesus says to people in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter six. Do you remember what he says, Matthew 6, 33? Many of you maybe have it memorized. What does it say? Seek what? First, the kingdom of God. And then all of these other things will be added to you. In other words, when you get your life out of priority, what happens is what you invest yourself in, this is key, doesn't give you what you think it does. That's what he was saying. He says you eat a lot, but you're never filled. You drink a lot, but you're you're never satisfied. You're, you're, You're earning all kinds of money, but you're putting it into a purse with holes in it. In other words, when your priorities are out of line, you keep searching, but you never really find what you're looking for, time, passion, and lastly, and we gotta talk about it, is money. Money is a huge indicator of what we value. In fact, if I wanna see what you really value in life, I can look at your money and your calendar and get a pretty good idea of what you care most about. This is why we talk about tithing, the practice of uh, of giving the first tenth of everything that we earn to the Lord. This is not a sermon about that, but it's a great a great place to think about that. And the reason that God's people have historically practiced this is it is a way for us to demonstrate that God gets first place in our lives. In every category, time, passion, money, all of it, God, you get my first and my best. I like the way John Stott, who was a brilliant pastor, theologian, I love John Stott, He said this, there are only two kinds of ambition. One can be ambitious either for oneself or for God. There is no third alternative. Jesus put it like this, you can serve God or you can serve money, your own pursuits, if you will. You cannot serve 
two masters. He said, you'll either love the one and hate the other or hate the one and love the other. You can't serve two masters. We're seeing this right now kind of culturally. It's one of the difficult things, honestly, about pastoring in Oklahoma. I love Oklahoma. But one of the challenges of pastoring in this kind of, I don't know, social context is that we have a lot of people who have grown up with a great deal of exposure to Christianity. We call that cultural Christianity, meaning that we're cultural, or we're Christians sort of in our minds, but not necessarily in our behavior. And I think this plagues a great deal, a great many people in Oklahoma, is that we're, 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 we have allegiance to Christ sort of in our minds with our stated beliefs, but when it comes to practically how we're living our lives, you would see no evidence of the life of God or even the, the worldview of the Bible. You, you just wouldn't see it. George Barna, and I was given this quote by a, a friend here recently, uh, wrote in a book, I, I think it's called something like Raising, what's it called, Raising Champions or Spiritual Champions, something like that, yeah. It's about raising kids, and it's an interesting book. Anyway, he, he says this, interesting quote. He says, an overwhelming percentage of parents think of themselves as Christian in this country. 68%, I imagine that value or that percentage is higher in this part of the world. But 68%, overwhelming majority. But only, and check this out, only 2%, Barna is a, a research, a Christian research house, firm, if you will. And so they, 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 they do a lot of research studies and found that 68% of people who identify as Christians, only 2% of them actually have a biblical worldview. That means when it comes to making decisions on everything in life, from relationships to morals to finances to values, public policy to lifestyle and everything else imaginable, biblical principles are rarely a determinant in their decision-making process. This is what Jesus was referring to when he said, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. We're Christian in name, but not Christian in action in deed. It's a hard word. It's a challenging word, but it's a good one. What Haggai would say to us, and what the Lord would say to us through Haggai, who is calling me? Elliot, what the heck? <laughs> Only my family can get through my do not disturb, you know? And so uh, I, the only people that can disturb me while I'm up here preaching are my family. I hope it's not an emergency. He'll have to call his mother because <laughs> I am busy. So <laughs> what was I saying? I don't even remember now. Thanks, Elliot. Um, yeah, so anyway, determining uh, decision-making process. I don't know. Anybody remember what I was saying? What was I saying? Changing what now? Oh, yeah, the challenging word. Yeah, it's to examine. <laughs> to think about what we're doing here, <laughs> to examine the priorities of our life. And that's what Haggai is calling us to, consider your ways. Maybe this week what would be useful for us is to take some time, just spend some time examining our lives, asking who gets the best of my time? Who gets the first and best of my passions, my pursuits? Who gets the first and best of my finances? See, this is a principle that goes all the way through Scripture, beginning to end, that we were made to live with, to dwell with God. We see this in Eden, God dwelling with man, but it was an interesting kind of visual or word picture, or actually metaphor, you could say, from the Old Testament. I think it's fascinating, and that is that of, of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was a tent-like structure that God instructed Moses to build in order to be a place where people would worship, sacrifice, and where God would meet with his people. Sometimes in the Old Testament, it's called the tent of meeting. This is the tabernacle. And the idea was that when they built the tabernacle, it was to be in the middle of, of the encampment. The, 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 the tabernacle would be in the center, and that all the tribes of Israel would encamp around the tabernacle, and this was not just to make it conveniently located, God was making a statement 
that the very way that the camp is arranged, that this is how your life is to be arranged, that the, the worship of God is to be the center of who you are, that everything else about you emanates from this primary, fundamental, ultimate fact about you is that you were made in the image and likeness of God, that you're in relationship with him and that your design and purpose is to worship him, to be in relationship with him for eternity. That's the idea. By time the temple was built, which was the kind of permanent, uh, the permanent tabernacle was built in Jerusalem, it became the defining structure of that community. N.T. Wright, a brilliant New Testament scholar, says this. He says, when we study the city plan of ancient Jerusalem, the significance of the temple stands out at once. And if you've ever been to Israel or you've seen pictures of the Temple Mount, I mean, when you go to Jerusalem, you just, you just can't miss, the, even though there's no temple there anymore, you can't miss the Temple Mount. It's the dominant feature of that city. It stands out at once since it occupies a phenomenally large portion, about 25% of the city. Imagine that kind of, I mean, the gathering place is a significant part, but it's not even close to 25% of the total size of Tulsa. That's how big the temple is or was in comparison to the rest of the city. Jerusalem was not like Corinth, for example. A large city with lots of little temples dotted here and there, and this is the key. It was not so much a city with a temple, more like a temple with a small city around it. Now, here's why I'm bringing this up. This is, I think, a good question to ask ourselves. What do you think of your life? Is your life a city with a temple or a temple with a city? Do you think of the activity of your life, all of your goings here, there, this, that, all the, the focus on, on, on raising kids and all, all that we do, there's a lot. Our, there's a lot of activity. But is your life a temple with a city or a city that happens to have a temple. See, I think a lot of people are trying to live lives like having a city with a temple in it. And I think the call of Haggai is to put God first in everything. For some of you, Christianity is not working, and this is why. Because you're Christian in name. You believe in Jesus, but you're not really, actually, truly, when it comes down to it, putting him First, you want to see massive change in your life and relationships? Put God first. The challenge of Haggai is to honor God as God, to put him in the place that he deserves. That is at the highest and best place in your life. The second word, actually, that Haggai gives comes after the people begin to respond. So look at how they respond. Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people. Look at this. And this is really uncharacteristic because you read a lot of the Old Testament and people don't respond often like this. They obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. So now we're moving in the right direction. Praise God. This is great news. Now he's going to give them an encouragement. Let's look at what that encouragement looks like. And if you're following along in a physical Bible there, you can jump down to Haggai 2.1. In the second year of King Darius on the 21st day, by the way, this is only about three months after the first word of the Lord had come. It came in August. This is now in October. So we're just a couple of months after the word of the Lord comes to Haggai again. And what does he say? Speak to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel. You're, if you read Haggai, you're going to get good at pronouncing these names. Governor of Judah, to Joshua, son of Josedak, the high priest, and to the remnant of the people, and ask them, who of you is left who saw this house in its former glory. How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? The Lord is addressing their emotions, I would say, the feelings that they must have. Now, the temple itself had been destroyed around 67 years before the Lord says this. So there would have been some people, not many, but a few, who were old enough and had survived the exile and made the journey 
all the way back. So there were a few among them. Kind of reminds me every year whenever D-Day, or the anniversary of D-Day rolls around and we see World War II veterans on social media. There are fewer and fewer every year, understandably so. They are quite old now because of how long ago this happened. Same kind of thing. There's a few people around who survived all of this, who had seen all of this, and now all that's left is just the beginnings of a foundation. And so he's asking them, how does, it, how does it look to you now? What do you see? Does it seem to you like nothing? In other words, we got a long way to go, don't we? That's how the people were feeling. But now be strong. Zerubbabel declares the Lord. Look at this encouragement three times. Be strong. Be strong, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest. Be strong. All you people of the land, declares the Lord, and here's the other key I want to get to, and what? Church, what does that say? And work, for I am with you, declares the Lord Almighty. Two halves of this encouragement, be strong and work. Here's kind of the thought I have for us here. Taking new ground with God in your life will always require work on your part. The plan of God in your life is not received by us passively. Salvation, yes. Sanctification, everything after that, requires partnership with God. And this is because God has wanted partnership with mankind from the beginning. You go all the way back, pre-sin, pre-fall. What God wanted with Adam and what he began to do in the garden was, hey, we're gonna work together. Name the animals, have dominion, work and keep the garden. This was all done before sin enters into the picture. Well, post-salvation, this is what God wants still with his people. He wants a partnership with us. And so what that means is that when God does work in your life, both positively and I'm going to call it negatively. And what I mean by this is often there are kind of junction moments, crossroads moments in your life. Maybe this takes the form of something positive. You got a dream from the Lord, a word from the Lord, or something that you're working towards, or you've got a, a new opportunity in front of you, a door has opened, and you're excited about pressing forward into what God has for you. That's a place that sometimes we find ourselves in. Those are fun filled with possibility, hope of a, of a new and different future. I've been there several times myself. But then sometimes there is a, a junction, a crossroads that we come to that's a result of something negative, meaning maybe it's a failure on our part. Maybe a relationship is disintegrating. Maybe a, a, a secret sin has just come out about us. M maybe, maybe something seems to be breaking down often, when life's not going according to plan or when we kind of hit what we say rock bottom, it happens. That's a time where we reevaluate our lives and it's often a time where we can take or we can set a, a course to take some new ground. Maybe you've been there. I'm not gonna live like that anymore. We're getting out of debt, whatever, right? We, we, a lot of us have been there. I'm gonna lose weight. I'm gonna change the way that I've been living. Things are going to be different from this day forward. Maybe you've been there. But have you found that when you begin, whether from a positive place or a negative place, what happens? It does not take long before it dawns on you that this is not going to be as easy as you thought in the beginning. Have you been there? Have you felt that? Have you tried to do something like that? That's what's happening with God's people. And so what he encourages them with is be strong, be courageous, and work. I am with you. Why do we need to be reminded of that? Because in the mundane moments of work, it can often feel like nothing is happening, like we're making no progress, like God isn't doing anything because it doesn't feel supernatural. But what I can tell you is in my own life, the most supernatural things that God has done have often come on the result, as the result of small, seemingly insignificant 
obedience that shows up in the form of work, sometimes inner work, sometimes outer work that has to be done over a long period of time. Eugene Peterson called this a long obedience in the same direction. I I love that phrase. A long obedience in the same direction. I I heard a, a wise leader once tell me, he says, we often overestimate what we can accomplish in one year and wildly underestimate what we can accomplish in five. In other words, we're, we want it done in a hurry. And if it doesn't seem to be happening fast, often we throw in the towel. What the Lord here is saying to his people is, be strong, keep working, I'm with you. It's having more impact than you realize. Now, this has been a huge lesson for me at multiple points in my life. I want to share maybe a couple of stories. We'll see how time goes here and see if I get to both of them. Last weekend, I received a, a great compliment. I was out in the lobby. I don't even remember after one of the services. Uh, Lady Tins Church on the move here stopped me. and She said, Pastor Witt. She said, man, I was so <laughs> devastated when... Uh, you took the church, you know. Dad's handing you, they're like, oh, great. <laughs> She's like, I, I'll be honest with you, I didn't love you at first. You, you, you didn't, you kind of seemed like you were here, there, all over the place. I even left for a little while. She said, but I've come back. And she goes, I don't know what you're doing, what's going on in your private prayer life. Do not stop because you're making a difference. And, you know, basically, very, very nice words, which I, I, I appreciated so much. There was a time when I hated those kinds of compliments. I'll tell you why. Because I wanted to arrive immediately. And this is kind of a, I, I think, I don't know, maybe the more aggressive you are, I don't know, maybe the more driven, I don't know what it is, maybe you can relate to this. We want to get there overnight. I remember when I got my call to preach. It came in a unique way. I was at a different church. I was in Dallas watching another pastor preach. I had been working at Church on the Move for, I don't know, nine years at that point, but I had never sort of entered my mind that I would be in any way associated with ministry. I mean, other than, you know, doing work for the ministry, helping my dad, of course, I loved doing that, but I never thought I would be teaching, preaching. That just had never kind of hit my radar. But I'm watching this pastor, and I suppose what it was was that he was so different than what I had been exposed to. He's just way different than my dad, honestly, way different than me. But it kind of gave me a vision. There was something as I was sitting there at the back of that auditorium, I just knew. All I could tell you is I just knew in my heart, I'm going to do that. Not only am I going to do that, I want to do that. That was a new want to for me. Hadn't been there before, but now it was there. And so I go back to work at the church not long after that, I get an opportunity to preach my first sermon right here in this room. Actually, I had preached at 180, but my first time preaching in this room, I remember wanting, uh, preaching in this room. And this is the, the arrogance of my stupid mind and heart. When I did this, this is what I thought. I thought, you know what? I am going to, I, I know this takes practice, but I am going to study every person I can find, every word I can find on preaching. I'm going to get really good and practice at the technique of it, and I'm going to blow these people away right out of the water, right out of the box. That was my thinking, that this will happen quickly. Of course, any of you who were there that weekend, you know it did not happen like I intended. But that was my intention. And what I was trying to bypass, here's the thing, and this is, this, I, 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 this is not just a cute personal story. I'm making a point with this. Here's what I wanted to bypass. The process of what, not just learning the technique of preaching. Let me just tell you something. There is technique and there is craft and we can talk about all of that stuff. I enjoy that conversation. What makes this this, though, is not the technique. It's what God has done in me. And this is not to toot my own horn, but you cannot stand up here as an empty vessel drawing from other people, trying to pour out of you what is not in you. And I I, I had to learn that lesson, the long 
and hard way because becoming someone that other people want to listen to does not happen quickly. And let me tell you this, for those that it does happen early in life, here's the common denominator what I've found with a lot of people that are, have a formidable kind of inner life and presence early on, usually, almost always is the case, the common denominator, suffering. Pain. Pain has a way of maturing and growing. I had a relatively pain-free life. It took the Lord then a long time to develop in me the kind of character and depth to be the kind of person who could stand up here and communicate what God wants to say on a week-in and week-out basis. Again, this is not me patting myself on the back. I'm just explaining to you the process. It wasn't sitting down and listening to other preachers and studying their techniques that made me better. It was allowing God to do in me what he wanted to do in me that made me who I am right now. And this is, again, I, I feel gross in even talking about this because it sounds almost as if I'm saying, I have arrived. I most certainly have not arrived. I'm just describing to you the journey of where I was to what God, is, what God has done in me. This takes time. One more story that I think might help. So when I took the church in 2017, and by the way, we just celebrated 37 years uh, anniversary as a church, and then seven years of my tenure as a pastor. Significant milestone for me. I don't, I don't know why, I've just been kind of marking in my mind seven years all the way up to this, this, this point. And so uh, for me, it's just been a point of reflection. Seven years as pastor, for me, 30 years of working at Church on the Move. Just this month is my 30 year anniversary of working at COTM. And a couple of you want to celebrate that, that's okay. It's something. <laughs> But when I took the church in 2017, again, high hopes, new season, new ground, God's going to do something. I was excited to step into the role of lead pastor. I felt all of this momentum right from the beginning, but it didn't take long till a lot of that hope began to wane, die. I started to see that this was not going to be as easy as I had initially thought. I guess I didn't think it would be easy. I just felt like we had some kind of momentum. I thought we would grow the church. I was not able to grow the church. I grew many other churches in the city by people leaving here and going to those churches. Church on the Move did not grow. We shrank. And we were shrinking for year after year, 2017, 2018, 2019, 20, 2020, of course. It was a hard season, hardest season of my life. What's amazing is that when I look at where we are today, and we just had a board meeting where we kind of look at over all of our metrics, it's amazing to see the momentum that we have. We've been growing for four consecutive years, double-digit percentage growth every year. And from a staff culture perspective, all the, all the different, every measurable you want to look at, it doesn't mean we're killing it everywhere, but just all the different measurables there's something happening here and God's been doing something, but you would not have known it was coming in those first few years. And it takes a while to get something moving. It takes a lot of work. What stayed in my mind, there was a, a, a metaphor from a book, and some of you maybe have read it. It's an old book from the early 2000s called Good to Great, Jim Collins wrote. Great book. And he's basically studying what it takes for an organization to go from good to great, and he gives this description of what he calls a flywheel. Imagine a giant wheel that you're trying to push to get it to turn round and round and round, only it's so heavy and it's so big that when you put your weight into it, nothing happens at first. You're pushing with everything that you have and it feels like you're making no difference. That's what it's like. And often that's what it's like when you begin a new season with God, whether from the bottom or whether it's a new opportunity. It feels like all of your effort is making no difference. This is why the Lord has to show up and say, be strong, be courageous, I'm with you, and work. Because it's going to take another push, and another push, and another push, and another push. It's going to take a thousand pushes. 
and you're gonna give it everything that you have, and I felt that from 2017 to 2018 and 19 into 2020 and watching all of that, and it was somewhere, I don't know, between 2021 and 2022 that it felt like the thing started to move. Just the slightest bit, we're moving in the right direction. Feels like there's starting to be some kind of change for the positive, and it begins to move, and then it begins to move even more, and then it begins to move, and this is what's cool. It starts to move under the weight of its own, or under the power of its own weight. And it feels like now you're starting to get some momentum, and now it starts moving faster and faster, and the effort that it takes to get it going is not nearly what it was in the beginning because it's already moving under its own momentum. And then someone comes along and says, now tell me, which push was the one that did it? Well, I don't know. It was one of 10,000 different decisions that were made. Friends, th th this is how God works. Are you trying to take new ground in a relationship? Are you trying to become the kind of person that has, I don't know, you're emotionally healthy, dealing with, it's not gonna happen in a moment. We love altar calls, we love moments where God shows up and occasionally that happens. But the vast majority of how God works in your life will always require work. Your participation with God was what will make the difference. And sitting around waiting for God to do some miracle and he's waiting for you to take the stinking step that he's put in front of you and do what he's told you to do. And when you do that, and you do that day in and day out for about a thousand days in a row, then you wake up one day and you go, holy moly, look at where God has taken me. I'm in a whole new place. Why? Because he did a miracle in my life just a little bit at a time. It's an incremental thing, but that's so often how God works. Lastly, we'll end here, the promise. So if you have your Bible, we'll look at 2.20, beginning in 2.20, reading to the end of the chapter. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Look at this. This is more specific, a little different than the other words. Tell Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, that I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. Now, if you're familiar much with the book of Hebrews, you know that this is a phrase that gets used there. Going to shake the heavens and the earth. This is the idea of judgment. God's going to upend the status quo. You've been looking around at the world and you go, man, this world seems upside down. Evil people seem to be thriving. The good are put down. This is not right. God says, yeah, you're right. I'm gonna shake the heavens and the earth. I'm gonna make things the way they ought to be. That's what he's talking about here. I'm gonna do this. I will overturn royal thrones and shatter the power of foreign kingdoms. I will overthrow chariots and their drivers. Horses and their riders will fall each by the sword of his brother. You have to keep in mind, guys, that this is a people living under the thumb of Persian rule. Ultimately, they would be under the thumb of Roman rule. They desperately wanted to be free. What they were looking for is another David to come along to expand the kingdom, and God had promised this again and again and again. There's somebody coming, kind of like David, better king, he's gonna expand my kingdom worldwide, and they were waiting for it. They thought it was a political Jewish thing. God says, tell Zerubbabel, this is what's gonna happen. Verse 23, on that day, this is a kind of a prophetic phrase, like a judgment phrase, on the day of judgment, that's what that means, declares the Lord Almighty, I will take, whoa, you, my servant, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. What, what does he say? Confusing language to some degree. A signet ring is a sign of a king's authority. What he's saying is Zerubbabel, I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give my servant, there's one coming who I'm gonna give a ring to, a ring of power. He, he will represent my authority. And he's gonna come through this guy, Zerubbabel. But you know where we find Zerubbabel's name again? In fact, it's not far from where you're at in your Bible right now if you have it open. Turn to the right, just a few pages till you find Matthew 1. I think it's verse 13. 
You know whose name you're going to find there? Zerubbabel's name, son of Shealtiel. You know why his name is there? Because he's in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Zerubbabel wasn't the king to come and save Israel. Neither was David. None of the kings, none of them could do it. This is because our bondage, the battle that must be fought is more than against Persia, against Babylon, against Rome. It's ultimately against sin. See, we're all slaves according to Romans chapter 6. We're all slaves to sin. This is what sin does. It enslaves us. And we need someone to liberate us from our slavery. David Foster Wallace, who was a novelist, not a Christian, by the way, gave this, uh, this is a quote from a commencement address that he gave in 2005. Look at what he says. Staggering quote. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the compelling reason for maybe choosing some sort of God or spiritual type thing to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough, never feel you have enough. Worship your body and beauty and sexual allure and you will always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally grieve you. Worship power and you will feel weak and afraid and you will need ever more power over others to numb you to your own fear. Worship your intellect being seen as smart and you will end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out. But the insidious thing about these forms of worship is they're unconscious, they're default settings. See, we gotta give ourselves to something. Everybody worships. The problem is that what we worship enslaves us and it's an inescapable cycle we need someone to deliver us from. That's who Jesus was. A liberator who came to deliver us from our captors. The message of God's faithfulness to the people in exile is a message of faithfulness to us that we find ourselves in a world of exile, but God has set us us free. The story of Haggai is really a story about us. It's a story about Jesus, the great liberator who sets us free from our captor. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes with me. Let's pray tonight as we close out this service. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the gospel, the good news that Jesus has come to set us free. All of us sinners, we've given ourselves to false gods, other idols, and they have enslaved us, but you have come to set us free, and who the Son sets free is free indeed. Lord, we declare yet again tonight our allegiance in and to you. Have first place in our life, in all areas of our life, in our time, in our passions, in our pursuits, in our money. Have first priority in first place. We give ourselves and commit ourselves once again to you, not just in belief, but in action, in Jesus' name. Heads bowed, eyes closed. You're in the room tonight. You say, Whit, I need to commit my life fully and completely to Christ. Maybe you've believed in Jesus for a long time, but you've never given him your all, your everything, but you want to tonight. If that's you, would you just wave at me? Say, Whit, that's me. I want your prayer. Anybody at all in the room like that? Say, Whit, I need your prayer. Yep, right here. Two hands right in the center section. God bless you. Anybody else? Might take me a second to find you. Where at, guys? Over here somewhere? Out here? Awesome. Don't see your hand. That's oh yeah, right there, back row. Awesome. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? Just wave at me. Say, "What? That's me. I'm committing my life to Christ fully and completely tonight." Anybody at all? Where at? Up at the top? Yep, up there. God bless you. Anyone else? Just wave at me. Say, "What? That's me." I want your prayer tonight. Anyone at all? We're gonna pray here in just a second. I don't want to miss you. Wonderful. Church, let's pray together. Repeat this after me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die in my place. I confess I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. And Jesus came for me. Lord Jesus, I give you my life 100%. All of me. I am yours. Thank you, Jesus for saving me. Amen. Can we put our hands together and celebrate with our brothers and sisters who raised their hand tonight? God bless you. As we close, prayer team will be down front. 
If you have a prayer need, if you raised your hand tonight, either category, would you come forward and let us have the honor of praying with you about whatever it is that you may be dealing with or connecting you into the life and community of this church. That's what it means to come forward here. We just wanna help you in your journey of following Jesus. So if that's you tonight, if you need to go get your kids and come back, go for it. We'll be down here for a few minutes. Prayer team, stand right here facing that way. Stand to your feet. We're gonna close tonight with this blessing out of Numbers chapter six. And we like to say it out loud together, just kind of a communal thing. Some things we do together here, singing songs, pronouncing blessings. Let's do it together now. You ready? The Lord bless you, keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. God bless you. I love you. We'll see you next week. You're dismissed.